Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church. And thank goodness our pastor is very fast. <laughs> um, we have some announcements to share with you guys today. First of all, we want to say thank you to everybody who was able to come to the uh, church Christmas party and fellowship. Uh, there was a very good crowd of people, and uh, I heard everybody had a great time, so that is fantastic. Also, we want to remind everybody that our Christmas cantata is going to be on this coming Sunday, December 24th, Christmas Eve at 11 a.m. It's called Come and Behold Him, and our praise team has been working so hard on this. They were here last night refining it, working on it. So um, please make sure you invite everybody you know to come and join us because they have worked so diligently on this. And if you are a member of the praise team and you're participating in this Christmas cantata, we are having our dress rehearsal this Saturday at 7 p.m. And so uh, make sure that you are here at the church this Saturday at 7 p.m. to join us to go through that. Also, we want to thank everyone who has so generously contributed to the Lottie Moon International Missions Fund. Again, this does support all of our missionaries who are out serving overseas, and it also supports J&T, our two missionaries that our church personally supports. And I can't believe this. But we have already given a total of $1,445 to the Lottie Moon Fund. So I want to give you guys a challenge. We just need $55 to hit $1,500. We, surely we can do $55 more. So just pray about how God is leading you to give to that. And again, thank you so much to everyone who's prayed about it or contributed to it. And I am going to turn this over to Big Oscar for Advent. As we celebrate Advent today, we're going to light the fourth candle. This is the candle of love. Jesus demonstrated self-giving love in his ministry as, the, as what we consider the good shepherd. And Advent is a time for kindness, thinking of others and sharing with others. It's a time to love as God loved us by giving us his most precious gift. As God is love, let us love also. John 3, 16 through 19 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And this is the verdict. Light has come into the world but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil.
this other song that we're getting ready to sing is just has so much meaning because truly when we come into the house of the Lord, we are here for one purpose only, and that is to have corporate worship. Here I am, Lord, to worship you today. Let us worship God. stand for the reading of God's Word. This morning our scripture reading comes from the book of Luke, the first chapter, and verse 38. 
Would you read with me, please? I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. You may be seated. As we go into the stewardship portion of our service today, our thought comes out of Luke 14, 28 to 30. And in this passage, Jesus is uh, talking to a group of people that are following him. And he's telling them or explaining to them about the cost of discipleship, the cost of being one of his disciples. And one of the illustrations that he uses is talking about having to think before you act. He says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will you not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if, you know, you can actually afford to build it? And that's what we have to think about as we give. Because giving to our church serves many um, purposes. And one of the key ones is... uh, Uh, to support the ministries that we have. And one of those ministries, you know, we we don't think about it this way, but these special offerings that we have, the Lottie Moon, Mary Hill Davis, um, uh, these offerings are for us to support missionaries out on the field. And those missionaries are doing our job because they are reaching people that we can't reach. And it's so important. And we have to think about this as we uh, give our tithes and offerings, you know, for the upkeep of this church and and for its local um, little ministries, that we pray to God to help us understand how we can give above and beyond to help those that are doing work above and beyond. And so as we look today, we will see another movie that talks about our International Mission Board missionaries out on the field. Most rising from the barracks where the Royal Guard still held out is new over Kuwait City just before 10 on the 2nd of August. When someone takes... Uh, AK-47 and put it to your chest and cock it. You know that you're only one pull of a trigger away. Some people would say that my parents weren't very responsible parents for taking me to Kuwait where the Persian Gulf War broke out. Some people would say that's irresponsible to take your kids with you into your calling where there's so much suffering. But rather than it taking me further from God, it actually helped take me closer to God. Because one of the things I learned at an early age, God actually calls the people of God to move towards the hardest places of this earth. Nobody knew anything about Kuwait. It was just this little dot on this map in the Middle East. But three months later on August 2nd, 1990, Saddam Hussein and Iraqi troops invaded Kuwait and we were living right downtown. There were four sets of Iraqi troops that broke into our apartment. And as a 10 year old, I just began like crying, and I didn't actually know if I was gonna live. I didn't know if we were actually gonna even make it through that day. We knew we had to leave quickly. Uh, I was held downstairs by gunpoint, but when I came back up the steps and we all jumped in a car and drove out of downtown, and there were Iraqi soldiers all around us, and we drove right through the middle of them as if God blinded them. And then we all gather into the American embassy. Within a few days, the embassy got locked down. They eventually turn off the water, the fresh water, and the and electricity to get us out. Heat was 120 degrees, no air conditioning. But the hardest part, I think, came six weeks later when uh, Lori and uh, Peter and Aaron left the embassy and I turned them over to Iraqi soldiers to take to, to the airport. Um, those are our hard moments, even this many, 30 years later. Because I want to live out God's call. And part of that living out that call is being connected to God's spirit and what is God asking you to do. 
And is he big enough to take care of you? Or do you think you have to do it all yourself? That is the struggle of following God. And then turn to God, God, if my life is taken, are you gonna take care of the boys? Are you gonna take care of the wife? Can I trust you? What was going on in the background of the story that I didn't know was thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people were praying for me personally. My mom, my brother and I now were back in Nashville living and it was coming up for the Lottie Moon Christmas offering that the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention puts together a week of prayer leading into this big offering every December. And there were literally millions of Christians all throughout the country that were praying specifically for my dad to be released. And it really wasn't real to me until I got on the plane in Baghdad that I was actually going to leave and survive and be home. It's not about me. It's about the millions of people praying and God doing a miraculous uh, event. I believe that God is looking for people who are willing to move towards the hard places and stay even when it's hard and trust that the Holy Spirit still speaks and confirms His promises in our lives. So you can see how important our week of prayer is and, and really how important daily prayer is for these missionaries that are out on the field because they're, they're not out um, really, you know, and most of them in, are, are in areas just like we saw here where their lives are on the line almost daily because they don't know. And it's through prayer that they make it through each day. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning recognizing that we have missionaries out on the field preaching your word regardless of the cost. And it's through your love and your protection that they're able to do this. And we thank you, Lord, while, while we sit safe here in our homes, that we're able to recognize the issues happening because we know there's wars and rumors of wars all the time and that our missionaries are in the thick of it. And we thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that we can have this opportunity to worship you freely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kingdom is forever. 
Just a preview of the uh, cantata coming up this next week. So you know you need to get your friends and family and strangers uh, here in the church to, to hear the whole cantata. It's going to be uplifting. Also, this week I um, got a present from a secret Santa in the mail. And it was a, a, a little gimme hat like this, and on it it says, Pastor Warning, anything you say or do could be used in a sermon. Now, I just want to say that God has blessed us with a perfect pastor's warning right here with Bill. I mean, he is a living, walking, talking sermon example. So, Bill, thank you so much. <laughs> as, we, as we look at today's message, this is the last one in the series. Ne uh, next week, we is going to be filled with song. We're going to have the cantata. We'll have some uh, regular hymns. It's just going to be a, an uplifting service. Then the following week is the 31st, New Year's Eve, so I will have a, a New Year's um, message at that time. And then as we get into the new year, you know, that's just two weeks away. Think about that, two weeks. Two weeks away. I will be um, beginning the, I will be beginning 
a series in um, Ecclesiastes, you know, called Under the Sun. So that will be good because uh, Solomon, you know, he, uh, he, he wrote Ecclesiastes to be uplifting. It's an uplifting book. You need to read that sometime. In fact, uh, you, you should read it before we have the series. But today, we're looking at a message titled Christmas, Christmas, A Line in Time. Now, as we've mentioned earlier, that there's never been an event in the history of man that has so defined human history as the birth of Jesus Christ. Think about it. Because of that event, we're all sitting here today. That solitary event shaped the world like no other has. It shaped how the world is viewed and really how people are viewed. The most now, now, here's a good point. You know, we, we have people that uh, just look for ways to uh, throw water on the parade, you know, on Christmas. Um, Prestonwood Baptist Church, you know, they, they put on a huge show every year. And the first thing that comes out is somebody writes in and says, see, Here's a church that's spending all their money on production instead of for the people. You know, they, that production is a ticketed event. You know, people pay to see it, and that money that they pay is what pays for all of the um, uh, things that, that happen in it, all of the um, uh, lights and music and everything. And, but yet people just want to throw water on Christmas and for churches to try to reach people. Because think about it, the most disinterested and antagonistic person will in some way acknowledge Christmas as something special. You know, even if it's just a paid day off. Even when people replace Merry Christmas with Happy Holiday. They're acknowledging that, you know, something special is happening. It's a special time of year. So if they're celebrating a holiday, what are they celebrating? The world today is what it is because of the birth of a child 2,000 years ago in a stable located in an obscure village in a country considered uh, insignificant by most of the known world. But Jesus didn't just come to change the world. He came to change people. The line that was drawn on that first Christmas would radically change the lives of every single person in the world then and now. Now, of course, the first people who were changed were those closest to the event. Christmas changed Mary and Joseph's world. You know, think about how, how could their lives not be changed? From the very foundation of time, Men and women have been chosen to spend their lives together in a socially and legally recognized union that we call marriage. Mary and Joseph were no different. Now, we don't know how they met. We don't know how old they were. We, uh, we, we just know that... Uh, they were engaged to be married, but they weren't married yet. Mary was a virgin. Everything in their life was going as planned. They were probably 
uh, in the midst of planning for the big day, dreaming of their lives together. And then all of a sudden, an angel showed up with an announcement that just changed everything. In fact, Matthew 118 sort of summarizes the story. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, just imagine what that news meant to Mary and Joseph. People would never view them the same. To some, they would always be that couple that had to get married. They would always feel the weight of the responsibility with which God had entrusted them. You know, in, in so many words, God told them, this is my son. He's going to save the world. And I want you, Mary and Joseph, to take care of him. I want you to make sure he stays safe and healthy. I want you to bring him up knowing about me. And for 33 years, Mary marveled at the son she called Jesus and the responsibility that was hers. To be truthful, you know, she probably couldn't comprehend God's plan when she held her son and laid him in a borrowed manger. She probably still couldn't comprehend God's plan when she held her son as he was laid in a borrowed grave. But regardless of what she could or couldn't comprehend, her words were words of trust. We read those just a few minutes ago in Luke 1.38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Another person whose life was changed was Peter. Christmas changed Simon Peter's world. How could Peter know that a chance encounter would not only change his world, but the whole world? Because of that first Christmas, the largest church in the world a city in Russia, and many hospitals all share the same name as this Jewish fisherman. In fact, it was early in Christ's ministry that we discover Peter doing what he had probably done every day of his adult life, and that was fishing. Now, Today, when we think of fishing, we think of either sports fishing, just going out in a boat and casting, you know, the uh, lure out there in the water, or maybe a large-scale commercial uh, fishing uh, corporation, you know. But this isn't the kind of fishing Peter did. It would have been similar to the fishing still done in developing countries around the world today. Two or three men in an open boat, throwing their nets, casting their nets in the water, and then pulling it back slowly by hand, hoping to catch enough to feed their families and then maybe have some left over to sell. Peter and his brother Andrew were fishermen, just ordinary men working at a living to provide for their family. And we, we pick up their story in Matthew 4, verses 18 through 20. It says, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. 
They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Think about it. Over the next three years, Peter became one of Jesus' closest friends. It was Peter who first clued in on the fact that Jesus was more than just a teacher or a prophet. It was Peter who walked on the water with Jesus in the night of that storm. It was Peter who said that he would die for Jesus before he would ever desert him. And it was Peter who denied Jesus the night he needed him most. That was when Peter discovered the truth. Jesus wasn't looking for people who would die for him. He was looking for people who would live for him. You know, what did Jesus tell Peter? Matthew 16, 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Because Jesus was born, Peter went from being a fisherman to the foundation of the church universal. He wasn't rich, and he wasn't perfect, but he was willing. And because he was willing, the church that would change the world had its beginning. From that unlikely beginning, hospitals, orphanages, universities, relief agencies have changed how the poor, the sick, and the disadvantaged are cared for and viewed. And so Christmas also changed our world. Jesus didn't come so we could have Christmas. Jesus didn't come just so we could have a religion. The message the angel gave to Joseph that night really explains why he came. In Matthew 1, verses 20 to 21, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus even defined his purpose and his mission in Luke 19.10. He said, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. You know, he's talking about us. Each of us is born with a longing for more. We know there's something out there. We can't name it or describe it. You know, Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Did you catch what, what Solomon is saying here? God has placed eternity in the human heart. A desire to, to connect with, with our creator. To have a relationship with God. That happened because he came as a child to bridge that chasm which exists between sinful man and a holy God. Now another place we can see how Jesus has changed things is in the 
story of the woman caught in adultery. You know, you might have read it. You may know the story. She was brought to Jesus by the religious leaders for judgment. You know, we don't know her name, but you can be sure that she would never forget the name of Jesus. She had broken her marriage vows and got caught. The best she could hope for would be a public divorce and just humiliation. The worst case scenario was that her husband could insist on her death, which he was entitled to according to the laws of the day. But, you know, as you know in the story, it's told in John's gospel and it's where we get the phrase, cast the first stone. You know, there, there was no doubt in the minds of the people concerning her guilt. In fact, the scriptures say she was caught in adultery. And in this story, you might remember the part where Jesus, when, when the religious leaders brought her out and, and put her in front of him, asking, you know, that she be punished, he just stooped down and began drawing in the dirt. Perhaps he was chronicling the sins of her accusers. And then he looks up and says in John 8, 7, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Then we pick up the story down in verses 10 through 11. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Because... There was a Christmas. There was a Jesus to save this woman from the consequences of her sin. On that day when her guilt was beyond question, Jesus offered her two gifts. The first gift was forgiveness from her past. You know, that... That's a gift that we all long for, what, whatever our past holds. But that wasn't the greatest gift because Jesus didn't stop with that. He continued and said, go now and leave your life of sin. You see, the greatest gift that Jesus offered this woman was the gift of a new future. And that's the same gift that he offers us today. You know, when you look at this story, symbolically, this woman represents every single one of us. The biggest mistake we make is seeing Christmas as a celebration of an isolated incident that happened 2,000 years ago. The challenge for us today isn't to keep Christ in Christmas. It's to get Christ out of Christmas, to allow him to change our lives and to change the world. When we realize that the child who was born to an unknown couple in an obscure village 2,000 years ago is truly the Son of God, when we embrace the message that he has taught and recognize that he died for us and rose from the dead, then we're understanding the difference that Christmas made, not then, but right now. When we allow his grace to become a part of our life, 
it will be as if someone dragged a stick through the sand, drawing a line that says, that was then and this is now. Because Christmas truly is a line in time for all of us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today praising your name, recognizing this marvelous gift that you gave us that not only changed the world, but it has changed our lives as well. And we just ask that you help us tell others about this marvelous gift and that they too can become a part of your family. This is a, a, a challenging time for Christians and it's a challenging time for the world. There is so much hate and anger and violence going on today that it's only through the love of your son that any of this can truly be changed. And we just ask that you continue to work in our lives and work in the lives of all who are around. And just bless everyone. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.